You know, on this theme about forgiving, and I've done a lot of work in this area. If anyone knows my life story, I was abused and abandoned and neglected as a child. I had various reasons an adult, as an adult had uh, individuals who I've had to find the strength to forgive. In fact, even when you don't get an apology, which can be really hard. But I had an epiphany uh, one day about the topic about forgiveness, and this is to your point about if you don't forgive, you're actually the sinner, which is sometimes we are hesitant or reluctant or don't find in ourselves to forgive because we want to extract justice right. out of pain. Right. We've suffered. It's like and swallowing poison and expecting it to kill the other yes. person. <laughs> right. And But the epiphany was that once you get in that mode of withholding forgiveness and wanting to extract justice or revenge, you actually become the perpetrator. That's right. Yes. That was one of the greatest epiphanies I had of yes. forgiveness and how important it is. And it helped you. No question. Because you don't want to be the person. Who no question. That's who right. Reacted against. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. So in the book, you also talk about um, relationships and that almost everything, there's a, a section of the book where you talk about what you tell couples uh, at their wedding ceremony. And I'm just going to read this little yeah. part of it because yeah. I think it's so powerful. It says, when I officiate at wedding ceremonies, I say things that are unique to each couple. But there's also something I tell every single one of them. I tell them that almost everything comes and goes in a marriage. Jobs come and go, apartments, condos, and houses come and go, money comes and go, health comes and goes, the world changes, our bodies change, even our children, just as surely as they come into our lives, leave us in some fundamental way, as the parents of the bride and groom are so bittersweet, bittersweetly aware, as they begin their own marriages and families. And almost everything comes and goes in a marriage. But if one thing remains, it is, then there... If, but if one thing remains, then their marriage will thrive and bring them the deepest kind of fulfillment and love. And that one thing is friendship. And real friendship depends almost entirely on their capacity for forgiveness. Yes. I, any of us who have made it through a decade or two or three or four or six, we know this, that without forgiveness, friendship can't survive. And without friendship, love can't survive. Um, and, and it, it, you know, the trick in all of these things, writing a book like this, is to be simple without being simplistic. And that, that's as simply as I can put it. If, if, you, if you don't protect your friendship in a marriage, there's no reason, frankly, to be married. Because everything else kind of comes and goes, you know. I look in the mirror now and I think my father walked into the room and said, <laughs> You know, and it comes and goes. It, but yeah. but the, uh, even in the Sheva Brafo, it says this is a Jewish audience, I can Jew it up a little for you. Uh, <laughs> the Sheva Brafo, the bride and groom are referred to as Reim Ha'ahuvin, loving friends. They got it. The rabbis got it. You think about you know, the story uh, after Sarah dies and Abraham sends his servant to go find a, a wife for Isaac. And, and, you know, the word order in the Torah is very deliberate. There are no mistakes in the Torah. Every word is deliberately <coughs> written in the order it's written. So if you look at the text carefully, it says, so he brings back this uh, Rebecca, who he, whom he chooses for Isaac because of her kindness, not her beauty. And... The text says, Isaac took Rebekah as his wife, and he loved her. Now this is precisely counterintuitive, precisely the opposite of what we teach our children. Daddy and mommy sitting in a tree, right? K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage. Then comes the baby. Right? The Torah has the opposite point of view. First comes marriage, then comes love. Obviously, you need a certain kind of love to spark a romance. Obviously, but it, I, I've always seen that as the Torah's way of, um, of 
of revealing to us that there's a certain kind of love, a certain depth of love, that only happens after years, after years of experiencing pain and challenge and joy together. Uh, you know, it, uh, there's a, a piece in the, a, a point of view in the book about pain and intimacy. Pain is very often an invitation for a more intimate relationship with another person. I, my, my father was a very tough and difficult person. And now he has Alzheimer's. It's been 10 years. And all of the sharp edges are. And, you know, when I was a little boy, as most little boys do, I would watch in awe as my father shaved in the morning. I never thought I would be shaving him while he stared off into space. I never thought that I would, you know, sit with him for hours and just hold his hand. I've never had a more intimate relationship with my father than I have as a result of this pain. The most intimate moment I've ever had with my wife was emptying her drains after her colon surgery. That's, that's intimacy. You know, to, to love a person when, when he or she is whole is one thing. To love a person when they're broken and afraid and vulnerable, that, that's quite another. And, and again, I'm not, not here to tell you these afflictions are worth it. I'm only here to say that they're an invitation to a deeper level of life and love and experience that we could achieve any other way. <laughs>